There are three things that Christ requires. First, sometime, somewhere, you must repent of your sin. That's not easy. We don't like to say I'm wrong, but sometime you've got to stand before his cross in a moment like this and say, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, I'm willing to turn from my sin. He was a person of integrity. That's not to say he never slipped up at anything, but several of his people said things like, you can just split him all the way down, <laughs> and it's, it's just the core is, is, is the same. Secondly, there has to come a time when by faith you receive him as your own Lord and Master and Savior. Lastly, you must be willing to obey him. You must go back to the campus, back to the high school, back to the gang, back to the crowd, and live for Christ, even if it means death. The, the, the difference between Billy Graham and some of these other preachers is that when God has something to say to him, he could get his attention. William Martin is the Harry and Hazel Siobhan Professor Emeritus of Religion and Public Policy in the Rice University Department of Sociology. Dr. Martin is known all over the world for a lot of things, but namely, he has written some perennial books that uh, will last not just a lifetime, but beyond. Dr. Martin's research and writing have focused on issues rela relating from religion to criminology and drug policies. He's the author of many important works, including the recent 2018 update, A Prophet with Honor, The Billy Graham Story. And I want to just hold that book up right now, and I want to allow our cameraman to just get a really tight shot of this. You know, I ran into your book several years ago. You published the first edition in... 1991. And by the way, welcome to Houston Baptist. Well, thank you. We are delighted <laughs> that you're here. Um, this is an amazing book. But let me also uh, point out some of Dr. Martin's other books. Here's With God on Our Side, The Rise of the Religious Right in America, the companion volume to the PBS television series. And then Dr. Martin opens his heart in a personal journey, My Prostate and Me, dealing with prostate cancer. And right now you're still challenged with that. After 25 years, it came back, but uh, the chances of surviving it again are good. And thank God for MD Anderson. Yes, indeed. So I want to tell us about first your background. I'm t I was terribly interested in, you know, you, where you came from, how you ended up at Rice. Can you give us just a bio synopsis? Okay. Well, I was born in San Antonio, yeah. right on the river. <laughs> there was talk of a plaque, but it's not there yet, last time I checked. Yeah. But anyway, I, I grew up in uh, Divine, about 30 miles south of San Antonio, and I started preaching when I was 14 years old, and just to, I had a driver's license for a year or two and drove around that part of the country, and then I went to Abilene Christian, mm. uh, then college, now university, and got a, a majored in biblical studies and then got a master's degree in that as well. And after that, one of my teachers at Abilene, uh, Lemoyne Lewis, was a, he'd been to Harvard, gotten his uh, MD or BD and doctorate there, and when somebody showed an interest, I, I had decided in his class, I want to be a college professor rather than a, than a, than a preacher. I was only 16 at the time, mm -hmm. but I thought, uh, this is the way I want to go. He said, well, then you need to go to Harvard Divinity School. I said, well, where is it? <laughs> I'll go. And uh, I did. I stayed on at Abilene, but, for, and, but I went to Harvard Divinity School from 1960 to 1963 and got my BD, now called MDiv. And after, then I stayed on to get my PhD in Religion and Society, which was a combination, it was a collaboration between the Divinity School, particularly in ethics, but also sociology of religion, and then you had a choice of a third field, interdisciplinary, and I took urban sociology, mm. and that, both of those. So when I was getting through, I didn't know whether I was going to teach in a religion department or a sociology department, but I had offers from both, and um, I wrote an article for, for the Atlantic Magazine, and uh, Rice sociologists saw that and said, would you come and interview? And my, we had three children, our parents lived here and hadn't seen them much over that time. So, and I knew about Rice, of course, coming from Texas, and I uh, was just absolutely delighted. And 50 years later, I'm in my 51st year at Rice, and I'm still delighted and considered a, a great blessing to have been there. 
Yeah, 51 years. It's just an amazing story. So was Harvey Cox uh, at Harvard Divinity? I was Harvey Cox's first graduate student. Really? <laughs> and of course, he wrote that very famous book on the... the, the secular whole, city. Yeah. And I also had classes from Reinhold Niebuhr and Paul Tillich in the same semester. Wow. Wow. And um, so sociology of religion is a fascinating topic. Indeed. My wife and I have filmed with a lot of the leading sociologists of the world. And so we're talking about the religious disaffiliation that's happening right now, this burgeoning community. Well, so much we can talk about. Let, let's start with, we, we began a moment ago uh, with Dr. Billy Graham here at Houston Baptist College in 1960, who gave that dedicatory uh, sermon. Different day in Houston, every high school busts their 12th grade class <laughs> to HVU and uh, our Houston Baptist College, I should say, and for the dedication. Uh, what, what caused you at Rice um, Department of Sociology to zone in on Billy Graham like you have? You probably know him better uh, than, than maybe anybody else I know of. I'll answer the first question, but to comment on that, about six or eight months after the book came out, um, I got a call one morning. I remember exactly where I was, and, and the, I picked up the phone. He says, Bill, this is Billy Graham. And I thought, it's the hour of decision. <laughs> but, uh, he said, uh, I've read, I'm almost through with your book, and I want to tell you it's the best book that's ever been written about me, and I think you know me better than anyone except Ruth, because... You, th you see things about me that I don't let myself see. Mm. I thought, <laughs> I don't know that a biographer could, could get a better comment than that. I th certainly think there are people, were people, who, know Billy, who knew Billy Graham certainly as well as I did. But it was, and he was given to generous comments, compliments. But I, I choose to take that one. Now, why did Billy say that? I mean, because, you know, Just As I Am came out. Jerry Jenkins sat here with me a few weeks ago. and I know that's Billy's rendition of his own story. But as I read your book years ago, I, I just saw a unique balance, you know. We have a tendency, as you know, when people die to venerate them like they're saints, that they never did anything wrong, never had any problems. We know that's not true. But how did you, how did you do write A Prophet with Honor? Yeah. Well, from the start of when I started writing, and I, I did a lot of writing for, for you know, Harper's, Atlantic, Esquire. That was that was my rather yeah. than rather than um, uh, professional journals, and I was hired on the strength of that, and that was my got tenure on the strength of that. So I tried to write things that would be. Uh, I, I used to say I write sociologically informed nonfiction for the literate lay public, and in doing, I thought it was always important to be fair and to, when writing about people, to write about them in a way that they would recognize as accurate, even, mm -hmm. if, even if they didn't always like it, right. that they would feel, yep, that's fair. Mm -hmm. So I thought it's, it's, a, it's a, a cardinal virtue to be fair, and I, I try to do that. So I, and Mr. Graham said when we first talked, well, to, to see how I got in, in, I was writing about different preachers, and not all of them were as, as honorable as Mr. Graham. Right. I'd written several. I had the first article I wrote about that was for the Atlantic, and it was called The God Hucksters of Radio. Yeah. And um, I was going to write a book about the electric preachers, right. and I, wasn't, I was at questions to whether even to write about Mr. Graham. But I was writing for Texas Monthly fairly regularly, and Bill Broyles, the editor at the time, gave me a call and said, do you know enough about Billy Graham to write an uh, article for us. Well, it happened. I had heard, I'd known about Billy Graham from the 50s. I'd written, uh, attended a crusade in Boston in the late 60s. Then when he came to Rice in uh, 1963, uh, well, actually, that's, that's a different story. <laughs> I've got my chronology mixed up there a little bit. But anyway, I said, yes, I do. I would be happy to undertake that. So I visited with him in Jackson, Mississippi, attended the crusade, and interviewed people there, and then wrote the article. And I got an, a note from him not long afterwards. It says, I think this was the best, fairest article that uh, I've ever, we've ever been written about me. And again, I knew he's noted for his compliments, but mm -hmm. I'd say, okay, I choose to believe that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Then I got another, after he came to Rice in, um, in uh, 83, um, I didn't even make a point to go and see him because I thought thousands of people have written articles about him. I did tell my students to go. I went, but I just thought I would be imposing. But then he said, I'm so, I'm, one of the things I'm really sorry about is that I didn't get to visit with you because I still think that article was one of the mm -hmm. best. And I just, maybe I can come to, to Houston and have lunch with you someday. And I said, not in these words, but I can, I can, I can pencil you in <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and then in 1986, uh, I got her 85. Uh, I got a letter from him. And it just said, um, it's the time in my life and ministry that someone from outside and with the academic credentials writes uh, an account of my, my, minist my, my little ministry and its place in history, if any. Just, that's underselling. And would you be interested? And so I, I yes, I, I thought for it for about a second, said yes, I would. And we got in touch. I went to New York to visit with him. And, when in that conversation, he said, I want you to do it. with. We don't have to have any control over it at all. It's your book. You, you look, the warts and all, they're warts. So I, I want you to be absolutely fair about this. I did request, and I put this in the introduction of the book, that I wanted him, he wanted him or members of his inner team to read the book for factual accuracy because I didn't want anybody to be able to say, well, we, anybody has his opinion, but we, we just wish it had been factually accuracy, accurate. So the book was thoroughly vetted by members of his team when I got to the manuscript, final manuscript scene. And we spent a couple of days looking over things and they said, this is remarkably accurate. <laughs> so. so how long did it take you to actually write A Prophet with Honor, the Billy Graham story? Well, I did the, just pretty much research only for about a year and a half. Yes. And, and that was broken up. I went, to, I went to Crusades in Paris. I went to a wonderful uh, two-week uh, uh, conference for international itinerant evangelists. In, in Amsterdam? In Amsterdam. I was there at that. That was yeah. wonderful. That's just one of the high points of yeah. my life. And uh, then I went to others, but, but uh, just the actual, for, for two and a half years, that's all I did. I took a leave from Rice and then for the next two years, I was still teaching, but I was spending all of my spare time in summers and weekends working on it. So it took five and a half years to bring it into the final version. I had expected it would take two. Wow. And when it came out, what kind of response? It was quite well received. It, was, it, it got good, good, good reviews. Um, New York Times was a little cool on it. They thought I'd been too kind, Mr. Graham. And, some thought it was not kind enough, but uh, I, you, you have read it, you, mm -hmm. you are, and you, I think you can see I was, I was neither fawning nor deciding to wield a needle or an axe. Mm -hmm. You know, Harvard Divinity School and some, you know, religion departments, sociology departments are not real close to evangelism and the ideal of that style of ministry. Um, how, how do you how do you relate? I mean, between Billy's paradigm of ministry and your own trajectory at Rice and Harvard and all the rest. Well, what I try to do as a, as a sociologist and as a writer is to say, I'm going to deal with this in in Mr. Graham's terms. I'm going to say he was he was successful at doing what he wanted to do. I'm very familiar with that, and in, in many respects. And part of that, in some respects, not part of that. Uh, when uh, one of his close aides said at the end of the, I mean, this was three or four, five years ago, uh, he said, um, we wanted somebody from outside. We wanted somebody who, who's not professing to be an evangelical, but professing to be a Christian, to, to look at this. And said, then we also didn't, we didn't know you'd go and look at all the presidential libraries. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I've been treated very well. By the uh, by, by all of the people in the organization, and uh, um, anyway, that's uh, I, I, I feel like again what I what I said earlier that my task in writing is to tell the story uh, as fairly as I can within the context that it's that it's that it's set, and to, to uh, there are things in the in the newer version in the the updated dated version 
where I talk about uh, Franklin's involvement with, uh, with, with uh, President Trump before and after the presidency. And um, I think that's a little more difficult. Right. So, and I mean, you know, anyone observing yeah. would see <clears throat> a, a difference in Franklin's uh, leadership position at VGA, close identity with uh, not only President Trump, but with the religious right mm -hmm. that you've also written about. Um, how, do you, how do you observe that? I mean, Billy, I remember before he died, received President Obama in his home. They, Franklin was there. And then I remember they took out full-page ads on the, the marriage issue, mm -hmm. which was very unique, <clears throat> uniquely different for BGA. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, take me to the point of the update. This is the 2018 copyright uh, update from Zondervan Publishing, A Prophet with Honor, The Billy Graham Story. How did that happen? I'm not exactly sure. I'm certainly aware and talked about that it happened. Um, Mr. Graham on a couple, of, and as, as you know, I'm not, when I say Mr. Graham, I'm, that's, that's what the people in his organization call him. Right. It's always Mr. Graham, Mr. G. Uh, that I'm not downgrading him saying, well, I have a, sure. I have a PhD. Right. <laughs> no. no, I understand. Yes, you understand that. Um, but um, he said several times, if I were going to do anything over in my career, I would stay out of politics. Right. That I'd said to do that and I didn't, and I know I stepped over the line sometimes. And um, he received President Obama, and I, it was very interesting there that he prayed for President Obama, but President Obama prayed for him as well. Hmm. And um, I think that, uh, well, and I, I say this without having talked to Mr. Graham about it, because during the, this latter period, he was just really, I didn't sure. want to bother him, and he was pretty pretty sick. We mm -hmm. had some communication, but not much. But it was cordial. Um, that uh, there were others, and I think, frankly, Franklin was uh, doing, this was coming from Franklin. I thought right. After the meeting with, um, with um, Mitt Romney, when he was running, and... Uh, Almost immediately after the, their, their meeting together, a press release, Mr. Mr. Graham said, well, this, I'm all for you, <laughs> and, uh, and um, came out in a way that he had not done before in a long time. Right. And uh, it's awfully quick to get a press release out. Right. Um, there, there are people in the organization who have, who have said, not people who have said it to me, but second-handed to reliable people in my mind, who just said that, that, that this is Franklin's this is Franklin's hand, and I, I believe that to be to be the case. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, uh, Franklin does a great deal of good in the world. Mm -hmm. Samaritan's Purse is an organization that uh, I greatly appreciate. I, I donate to it, sure, and I urge others to do. He, he does a tremendous amount of good. There are those who have said Franklin is his mother's child. Mm -hmm. uh, Ruth is a wonder was a wonderful person as well, but she was willing to. Right. say this. I, I had one conversation at their uh, lunch table once and uh, they were talking something about something, somehow uh, capital punishment came up. And Ruth said, well I think capital punishment is good. I, I feel uh, and Mr. Graham said, well I, I just feel it, it's, it's, it often hits the people. It's not fair in the way it's given out and I just think it's too harsh. And, she, and then she said, well I feel a lot safer in countries where they have capital punishment. He said, well, darling, I've been in a number of people that have number of places that had capital punishment. I didn't feel safe at all. Right. So. <laughs> I, I can understand that. Well, let's go back to Billy with Richard Nixon, that huge political disappointment. I mean, Nixon, Quaker background, really played up to Billy, used Billy. He did. And, uh, and then the real Richard Nixon and those infamous recordings come out, and it's, you know. It was his, devastating. Yeah. He, he wept, he threw up, and he almost lost his innocence with respect to Richard Nixon. For a long time, he tried to put it off. He just said, well, he wouldn't have done it. It was the people around him. But I interviewed H.R. Haldeman and John Erlingman and other people who were around him and Charles Colson, and I said, the evidence is to, to Charles Colson, 
the evidence is so clear that you were using him. He said, of course we were using him. That's what we did. Right. And, uh, but the la after Mr. Graham had read the, the manuscript, and, and I had told him before, we, before I interviewed him about, uh, the, about Nixon particularly, but other presidents. And I saved that to last because I didn't want to cut short any, you know, sure. any warm res responses. But, he, but I'd sent him uh, things from the archives, uh, and the National Archives, that had, a lot of them had been pulled out of Nixon's. But uh, the talking points, the letters, we got to use Billy Graham, his group, use him any way you can. It was just, it was really pretty, pretty manipulative. And we were, after all of that, I was visiting him, and he was sitting on a couch in his office, which is a very modest office. I've been in there. Yes, it's just, it's just. In Montreal. Right. It's just, this is, you know, this is not the thing. This is not, it doesn't have any six flags for no, Jesus. No. Over <laughs> Jesus out in the front no. yard. No. Uh, but um, uh, he was sitting on the couch, and he put his arms out like that, and he said, I knew what I'd said to the president, and I knew what he'd said to me. But when I saw all of those memos and talking points circulating in the background, I felt like a sheep led to the slaughter. Mm -hmm. And he, I thought it was, it was so interesting because I was just, that he was a absorbing that, not having known it in, in many of in those years past. But he wasn't denying it. He wasn't trying to get out of it. He was, he was saying I was wrong. And, and we might add that Billy's interface with presidents began before Nixon. I remember oh, yes. John Kennedy asking him about the second coming of Christ, you know. I mean, so... Well, of course it began, well, it began badly with Truman. Yes. No, that uh, Billy always wanted to be, he was fascinated by politics. He was always trying to penetrate that, that realm. And so when he was back a college professor in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, he was trying to get President Truman to send a letter of greeting or to visit or something sure. like that. And Truman just kept putting him off. Sure. And uh, finally gave, gave him and three members of his team a visit to the White, White House. And uh, they, they violated protocol somewhat, but they asked the president, could we pray with you? And yeah. he said, well, I guess it can't hurt. So he, they put their <laughs> arms around him and prayed. And then they went outside and knelt. Said, Knelt, knelt on the fr uh, in their white suits. They looked like a gospel quartet, <laughs> 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 kneeling there, and uh, they made the papers that all over the, the country the next day. And Truman said, "I don't want him. He's all he's interested in is publicity. If he ever asks for another visit, put it down." And I just think it's so interesting. I've talked to other people who were there, and, they, and one of them, Grady Wilson, said, "We were so naive." Yeah. But it's interesting that the the opening page of Mr. Graham's Just As I Am, his biography. It, the opening words are, it was this date, and I was about to make the biggest, about to embarrass myself for the rest of my life or something like that. So it, it stuck with him for all of, all of those years. But he did make friends with Eisenhower. And sure. In fact, played a role in uh, convincing Eisenhower that he should run for office. Mm -hmm. and Eisenhower acknowledged that. And there was probably no doubt a sovereignty of God in that whole leadership factor of Eisenhower at this time, at that time in our nation. Well, he he was he was certainly the man for the for he the was. for the time, and uh, then he helped. He gave he visited Eisenhower at uh, at the Brown uh, the Brown, not Brown Derby, but anyway, the hotel in in uh, Denver at the convention gave him a red Bible, and he helped with the religious aspects of the inauguration. And, of course, that led him into the friendship with Richard Nixon, whose parents he had already met when he held a famous crusade in 1949 in Los Angeles. Sure. His parents were evangelical Quakers. It's a little bit of an odd combination. And they were from, what, Whittier, California? Uh, he went to school in Whittier. They were yeah. from that, I don't know whether they were actually from there, but sure. yeah, in that area. And that's where he went to college. Uh, but then he became friends with Nixon and counted him one of the one of his greatest friends of, of all of his uh, all of his life, and uh, uh, supported him supported him more than he should have. Uh, but he, he 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 held a conference in Switzerland for a few evangelical leaders to see what we can do to keep uh, Kennedy 
from, from being elected because he was a Catholic. Right. And uh, then mm. there was Norman Vincent Peale was at that conference and came back and held another conference, and uh, he got scored for it heavily. Graham did not attend that, but his fingerprints were all over it. Sure. So it was a, and then, uh, but in any case, he uh, he had a friendship with with Kennedy, but Kennedy kept him at a distance. Mm -hmm. And then he figured after Kennedy's election that uh, he would not be welcome in the White House for a long time. But in doing that, he underestimated Lyndon Johnson. And of course, those <laughs> Kenny Bunkport vacations with the Bush family yes. and yes. spiritual interaction with George W. Indeed. Led Indeed. him to Christ. Indeed. Um, it's an amazing story. Let's, just for a moment, the secrets of Billy Graham. I mean, there was a genuine humility. I'd be interested to know what your takeaway is of the man. What sure. are the most notable takeaways? Well, certainly he was a person of integrity. That's not to say he never slipped up at anything, but several of his people said things like, you can just split him all the way down, and it's, it's just the core is, is, is the same. There are no dark secrets he made. Uh, one of his, this was at the time of the, the, the scandals with Jimmy right. Swaggart and all of, all of that. And um, Russ Busby, who was his photographer and yeah. stuck with him for, I think, half a century and no doubt knew him better than I did. Mm -hmm. But he said, Billy has a big ego. It takes a big ego, uh, it takes an ego to be a big preacher. And Billy had an ego, but he never let it get out of, uh, out of, out of, out of control. He said, I'm not talking about a month or two. I'm talking about a day or two or, you know, three or four days. He says that the, the difference between Billy Graham and some of these other preachers is that when God has something to say to him, he could get his attention. Mm -hmm. So th there, there certainly is the, is the integrity. There are none of the scandals. And part of that is, you're well aware, in 1949 in Modesto, California, they got together the four of them. Modesto Manifesto. Who said we won't. We'll, we'll protect ourselves against sexual uh, problems with never being alone with the woman, not your wife or daughter, and not lying about the, uh, the size of the crowd, not, not uh, uh, raking on the local preachers. You know, you, they're not as good as I have sent the money to me, yeah. uh, those things. And um, the, the, so that stuck through. He would never have had any significant scandal. But about what you're saying, the humility. And the humility is interesting to me, was the humility was genuine, but he was also ambitious. Yes. And that was genuine. Yes. And so what was interesting to me in writing about that was to, to see this tension. And it was, even as a, one of the stories that was told, that when he was a boy, he would tell his friend, uh, Went, uh, I don't remember his last name right now, but anyway, he says, Went, and he had a good, he had a nice watch. He says, Went, if you have a good watch, people will know you're not poor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then when he was a, just a little boy, he would, uh, out on the park road in Charlotte, he would lead a little parade of a, a, a wagon and a goat and the dogs, and he would march along like a drum majorette in front of them as if he didn't even know anybody was going to pay any attention. <laughs> and when he started preaching in one little town, he had, he had signs that said, um, uh, here, Billy Graham, one of America's great young evangelists, which he wasn't yet. All right. <laughs> and and uh, 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 what Grady Wilson, one of his long, lifetime friends, said in one town that it had about 200 people there, and they printed up 2,000 flyers. He said, if they had a population explosion, we were ready. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, but even his, his dean at the Florida Bible Institute said, Billy always wanted to do something great for God. He didn't know what it was yet, but he wanted to do it. So there was always that, uh, you know, he said, uh, I wish I'd never see, ever see myself, my name's up in lights. It just bothers me when I go into a city and see these billboards and all of that. But he had a wonderful organization that that's just what they did. Sure. And he wasn't calling them off. So it's just a, uh, it's a, it's just, it's a tension there. And uh, I, th I think that he, he was, uh, when, in talking with him the first time, I called him Dr. Graham. He says, no, don't do that. He says, you have an earned PhD. <laughs> Mine are all honorary for people who want me to speak at their graduation. <laughs> he says, I don't even list those. Yeah. He said, now, if it were Yale or Harvard. Yeah, no, right. but, uh, yeah. uh, but anyway, he was just, uh, I think one of, the, when, one of the last days that I was really, I'd go and interview them for two or three days, you know, four or five hours a day. Sure. 
And the last day, it was an icy, icy day up on uh, Little Piney Cove Road. And well, there's a workman that worked for them, and his wife worked inside the house, and he was a handyman. We were coming down the road, and icy in the Jeep. Yeah. And he said, you've been visiting with some mighty good people today. Me and, my, me and my wife have been working for Mr. and Ms. Graham for 15 years, and I'm telling you, they are the same inside the house as they are outside. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. We're talking to Dr. William Martin, and he is the Harry and Hazel Siobhan Professor Emeritus of Religion and Public Policy in the Rice University Department of Sociology. But also the Siobhan Senior Fellow for Religion and Public Policy at the Baker Institute for Public Policy. Okay, and so let's, the Baker Institute, of course, James Baker, and I, I try to keep in touch with the Baker Institute. Explain just, if you would, that Baker Institute at Rice. Well, the Baker Institute began uh, 25 years ago. We just had our 25-year gala right. uh, in November, and President Obama spoke, and John yeah. Meacham and, and uh, Secretary Baker yeah. had a conversation there. And... Um, Saw that. In the yes, news. yes, it was it was wonderful, <laughs> but the Baker Institute was we, we, <clears throat> um, because Mr. Baker was from Houston. Members of the political science department talked to him about s starting an institute and thinking we'd be able to raise the money for this, and were. But it started small, but now it's a it's a you know a full blown think tank, and not only full blown, but it is ranked in the top fifteen or sixteen, maybe seventeen uh, think tanks in out of 4,000 in the United States. Wow. And now it's either second or third among think tanks associated with the university in the world. That's amazing. And the, the, energy, the energy center program is ranked number one in the world. So it is, it is now a, it's just, I, I enjoyed, I loved being in the sociology department and I, I still love that department. But for the last, when I grad, uh, retired from teaching in 2006, I moved over to the Baker Institute and have been there for the last, you know, for, for the years since that. But I love being able just to walk down the hall and see mo <laughs> the young people, nearly everybody's younger than I am, <laughs> but uh, to see people who are working on, you know, I've got, had five or six Muslim people you know, who are working on Middle Eastern issues and sure. energy people and that e health economics and uh, Mexico Center and, uh, all of these things. It's just such a vibrant, exciting place to work. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I feel like this is a, just a really, it's a blessing to be able to, to end my career, but it's not over yet. Yeah. <laughs> and your position with the Baker Institute? I'm senior fellow for uh, religion and public policy. The Chavans, the, 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 the Chavon, Harry and Hazel Chavon, who's give, who given money to HBU, right. for sure. Um, they, the money they gave was actually for the Baker Institute, but I was doing both of them uh, at the time because I've been, I was on the search committee that brought Director Edward Jeregian 25 years ago. Wow. So, and and was, had a publication in the first book, that, I mean, the, the inaugural book. So I've been with them since the, since the very beginning. Um, but it's just been a, it's a wonderful invigoration for, for my uh, life, it's, it's a... I can totally see why. I wanna to touch on, uh, uh, before we close, um, your book, With God on Our Side. Obviously, the religious right is a topic we have been really studying because some attribute uh, the gestation of the nun's phenomenon as one causal reason, the rise of the religious right. And the basic gist would be that we have clouded the, mes the redemptive message mm -hmm. of the gospel by a litmus test of social issues. And those who maybe are investigating faith or they don't know what faith is, they, they see it reduced to a certain set of social issues. Now, you know, you obviously <laughs> dove deep into this, and this probably would be another good half hour, but <laughs> what would you pull away from this book? Because I'm going to read this. Uh, after our filming, what would you pull away from the rise of the religious right? Are you referring to Paul Weirich and Jerry Falwell and yes. Tim LaHaye? And, and even, even well, Warwick, well, Weirich was in very early, right. one of the very earliest ones. Um, this was done um, 
with with as part of a, a with the you mentioned that is with the companion piece to a B PBS series by that by that same name, and so I, I they did it was P their team did most of the research, but I was a, called chief consultant and then writing the book because I, they invited me to do that because I already had been writing about that topic, about the the, the political aspect of of uh, evangelical Christianity and fundamentalist Christianity. Um, there were a number of things that there was. One of the things that really kicked it off during the well, when Goldwater was was smashed by Lyndon Johnson, uh, then they decided we got to. <laughs> the Republican Party looked like it's dead forever, and so people like Paul Weirich and others began to organize very very carefully to do that. And uh, Richard, I'll uh, say, uh, the, the, the direct mail person. Uh, his name is very simil similar to yeah, my right. accountant's name, right. and I, I wrote I wrote to him this morning, so right. I can't get that name out. <laughs> but anyway, he was the one that really was a direct, direct mail fundraising right. expert, and uh, they they began to do this more from a secular standpoint. But they also real after after Carter was elected, and they uh, one of them said. Religious evangelical Christians represent the strongest, the, the largest cut of uncut timber on the political landscape, mm -hmm. and they set out to do some heavy logging. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, a lot of it was, a, a lot of the things that bringing in Falwell and those people was pretty self-conscious and uh, I won't say cynical, but it was, uh, it was um, deliberate for, primarily for political reasons, although with a number of them, like Wyrick, very strong religious uh, uh, convictions as well, and perhaps the others as well. But in any case, um, there there was during the '60s there was the you know sex, drugs, and rock, rock and roll. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. And everything not nailed down is coming loose. And so there was there was that kind of uh, reaction to that already ready. And then in Carter's time, the particular thing that really seemed to have kicked it off was um, Carter's going to remove the tax re, uh, reduction or the tax, uh, not having to, tax, you know what I'm saying. Exemption. No, tax exemption, thank yeah. you. The words used to, the synapses used to fire, now they just lob. <laughs> 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 but uh, the, the tax exemption and from on the, on the Christian schools, that, uh, many of which were started because of segregation or integration, but uh, that just generated a lot of, a lot of anger and that, that became a core another core of political uprising around, around uh, evangelicals. And then, of course, you did have uh, Jerry Falwell and others who had a wide uh, political uh, audience and, and started, uh, Falwell was one of the pioneers in saying we gotta register people to vote, you know, get them, get them, get them saved, get them baptism, get them re baptist, baptized and registered to vote so that uh, evangelical churches were able to become a, a political power. And I've said in terms of their effectiveness, not so much in terms of just their, but their effectiveness was they were able, and, and to a significant extent still are able, to talk to a, a, a group of people who know each other, who share views, to give a coherent message, and then, then uh, uh, underscore it uh, every three times a week. Yeah. And so there, there's that, and... and uh, the, the left has nothing like that right. as, as, a, as a political organization. But I th again, then what, to come up to what you were saying, that, that uh, I think certainly the, the, the secularization of the, of the country, which Harvey Cox talked about in the 1960s, and then we've had a tremendous response of religion. Religion hasn't gone, hasn't died. And another thing I study is is the fundamentalism in, in other parts of the world and, and Islam as a, as a key example. Religion has not gone away and it's not going away, but in, an, in a number of circles, there has been a, an attenuation of, of, a, of attention and of a, a commitment. And so there's, we're losing the world, we're losing our kids. And so let's, who, who is speaking out on, the, on behalf of that? And uh, so that, that generates the, the support. How that turns in to admiration and dedication to Donald Trump, 
is a tremendous paradox. Mm -hmm. That is a whole nother half hour. <laughs> we we're talking to Dr. William Martin, and uh, we just want to, again, highlight this great book, A Prophet with Honor, The Billy Graham Story. This is the updated edition, 2018, Zondervan Press. You've got to get this. Everybody should have this book. Uh, there's so many life lessons in it. And, of course, with God on our side, and I do want to close and just tell you our thoughts and prayers are with you as you, you. face this challenge of cancer. My Prostate and Me by William Martin, Dealing with Prostate Cancer. I know that is a theme that could relate to many. We really are grateful for you taking the time to come to Houston Baptist University and share your thoughts. And Well, thank you, Dr. Martin. Thank you, Rob. And very much appreciate being invited.